Hey, happy Christmas and welcome to the Elim Church Home Valley Christmas Day broadcast from West Yorkshire. Praise the Lord. It's great to have you with us. You'll notice that I'm not in the village hall. This is because this is a pre-recorded broadcast, but it's exactly the same carols, exactly the same message, exactly the same Bible verses, and exactly the same jokes that we'll be having at the Christmas day service live at the village hall. But this is for you to enjoy right now. And you've got an advantage over us at the village hall because you can join in the singing. And uh, before we start with our singing, Gail's going to come and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can celebrate your birth this morning. We pray that as we sing the carols or listen to the carols and as we read your word, we will get a greater revelation and understanding of your love for us today and what your birth meant for us. Hallelujah. In Jesus name. Amen. There is one carol that we can only rightfully sing in its entirety on Christmas morning, and that is O Come All Ye Faithful. We hope that you like this rendition of this traditional carol. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come. 
And I'm going to read now from Luke 2, verses 8 to 15. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, yes, you know, I'm going to, what I'm going to say next, don't you? Yes, behold, take note, prick your ears up. There is about to be something amazing and something awesome about to be said. Something of truth, something of theological significance. Behold, and behold, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, <laughs> if we aren't beholding now, let's behold again. Prick your ears up a second time. Here comes a next awesome statement. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them unto, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. And see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the truth of his word to us today. Angels from the realms of glory. from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er all the earth ye who sang creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth come and worship come and worship worship Christ the new
Father, we thank you that we can celebrate the birth of Jesus this morning. Thank you that you sent Jesus to save us from our sins, to save us from our sickness, from our oppression, from the darkness. Thank you that he came. He lived the perfect life. He died the sinner's death, our death, in our place instead of us. But then he rose again, triumphant over the grave, and now he lives and reigns forever. And you have sent us your Holy Spirit to live within our hearts so that we have light and life and joy and peace. And we celebrate all those things this morning because you came. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you our worship on this Christmas morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The bells start jingling. Mariah starts singling. Cinnamon and pine aromas cause us to remember. Families get tinseling, excitement tingling. For goodness sake, it's only November. Because in the 11th month, the ballads begin. Catchy Christmas choruses cling to you and your kin. Top to toe in tailbacks, the boys of the NYPD choir. Chestnuts roasting, by now surely burning, on an open fire. Shaking Stevens, Wham, Bing Crosby, Band-Aid, Buble, Slade. Wizard, do you really wish it could be Christmas every day? Think of all the shop assistants, six weeks of it to get through. As Bono said, tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. But above and around, beneath and beyond the modern Christmas ditty, is a deeper song, eternity long, a melody of old, hear it unfold, the greatest story ever told. A hurting world, an angel's promise, a family scandal, a husband's fright, in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. Where infinite influence, omnipotence suppressed, the word becomes flesh in diapers dressed, the fabled stable becomes a creche and blessed. As majestic God assumes mortal guise, lo, within the manger lies he who built the starry skies. See, the real song of Christmas is more than just a carol. It's an anthem of atonement, a refrain of redemption. In our anguish, heaven smiled. The song's composer becomes a child. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. But the peril, the danger of away in a manger is it can make our Christmas story stranger and rearrange her from a game changer, the heaven hell exchanger she is. Because the destiny of the Christmas baby was to die. But in our lieu, from fairy tale birth to criminal's cross, tonight, thank God, it's him instead of you. So in the musical sweatshirts, the John Lewis adverts, listen, remember the song. In the activity, remember the nativity, your pain and shame undone. For to you a son is given, over you a song is sung. But don't just remember, respond and surrender. For Christ the Saviour is born.
Amen. This is Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. You will be with a child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. May God bless his word to us this morning. Holy Spirit, teach us something new. Make the word alive to us today and change our lives. Amen. I want to talk to you about the, first of all, by that statement that the angel made to um, Mary, nothing is impossible with God. If you're a scholar of the Greek language, the experts tell us to note the emphatic position of the negative article. Well, that means absolutely nothing to me. But what it does mean is this. It means nothing is impossible with God should be literally translated absolutely nothing without any exception clauses is impossible for God. And the angel here was talking about the virgin birth. Mary's pregnancy was no ordinary pregnancy. And when you think about it, the Bible is full of extraordinary pregnancies. We can start with Abraham and Sarah, for example. God promised Abraham that he would have a seed that would be the blessing to many generations after him. And uh, trouble was, both of them were, the, were in their old age. Well, to come up, cut a long story short, Isaac was born to Sarah when she was how old? 91. Think about it, you mothers, um, giving birth at the age of 91. And then, oh, here we are, Maria del Carmen Basuda de Lara. Do you know who she is? No, I don't. I'll tell you. Well, she is the oldest verified mother to give birth. She had twins just short of her 67th birthday in 2005. But that was with IVF, so I call that cheating. Um, and the oldest verified mother of child conceived by natural methods is Dawn Brooke. She lived on the island of Guernsey. And in 1997, she had a child at the age of 59. But then Abraham and Sarah, or Sarah giving birth at the age of 91, is uh, not the only unusual birth in the scripture. Think about Hannah in the Bible. She was another childless mother. And according to Jewish tradition, if you'd been married for 10 years and you hadn't had children, uh, then your husband had the right to take a second wife and have children with, with her. And this is exactly what Elkanah, who was the husband of Hannah, did. He took a, a second wife, Pen Penaniah. And uh, he eventually had 10 sons and two daughters with his second wife. Now, Ladies, how would that make you feel if your husband uh, had so many children with, with somebody else and you couldn't yourself bear children? Well, it wouldn't make you very happy. And that's exactly how Hannah felt. She didn't feel very happy either. And she prayed and she sobbed her heart out to God and God heard her prayer and Samuel was born. 
And then there's Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, the parents of John the Baptist. Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, a model couple, if you like, but the only problem with their lives was they didn't have any children. Elizabeth was barren. And uh, in this episode of Bible action, um, the angel appears to Zechariah whilst he was offering incense in the temple and says, your prayers have been answered. Elizabeth is having a baby and you're going to call him John. God is gracious. Now, I want you to stop here for a moment. Um, well, in fact, I'll stop here and make comment about something else. Your prayer has been answered. Do not fear. And uh, I was writing some Christmas cards and I was writing some Christmas cards. I felt the Lord uh, say to somebody that I was writing the card to uh, just to remind them of this verse that the angel spoke to Zechariah. Do not fear. Your prayer has been heard. Hallelujah. That's what the scripture says. And I believe that was a, a, a word for that uh, particular couple that I was uh, uh, writing to, but maybe it's a word for you as well. Maybe you're watching some place around the world and uh, you're worrying and worrying and worrying and thinking, oh, is God ever going to hear my prayer? I think I believe that God's word for you this morning, this Christmas Day morning, is fear not. Your prayer has been heard. Trust in God. Hallelujah. But then that was not only the amazing thing that was going to happen to Elizabeth, that she was going to have a child. But the other amazing thing was, is that they were going to call the child John. God is gracious. Hallelujah. And it reminds me that God is gracious. It's not about God zapping you from with his finger down from heaven at every false move that you make. But God is a God of grace who doesn't treat you as you deserve. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, there are lots of amazing things we could say about this. Um, uh, again, it's the first time that the angel has appeared for 400 years. Hallelujah. Um, the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, uh, was the last time that God had spoken in the prophetic word. And that was 400 years previously. But now we have a new page turned and we're starting the New Testament. Hallelujah. God is gracious. Now, it's almost as if Luke, in his narrative, is building up to something because he's telling us about the extraordinary announcement to Zechariah about John the Baptist's birth to his barren wife, Elizabeth. Uh, but you ain't heard nothing yet because I've got something even more amazing to tell you. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about a humanly impossible birth. Everything we've talked about so far were amazing, unusual births, but nothing would be more spectacular than the birth of Jesus. Nothing would be more jaw-dropping than what I'm about to say. I'm going to tell you about a humanly impossible birth. Mary, who wasn't even married, a young country girl, was going to be the first person in human history who would not fall pregnant because she had been impregnated impregnated by a man, but because the Holy Spirit had overshadowed her. The impossible conception of Jesus was because of the Holy Spirit. The recognition of this supernatural act is often confessed in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Almighty Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Now, it became very trendy at the beginning of the 20th century uh, and throughout, well, it's probably trendy today by many, in, in many circles, uh, in many theological circles, to dismiss the idea of the virgin birth because we all know, don't we, that science says that it's physically impossible. It's not rational. And indeed, it almost became a badge of respectability amongst some that they had seen the light and stopped believing the silly things uh, that are written in the Bible and are common sense rubbish to everybody who is ready, ready to admit it. These things, the virgin birth, the Christmas story, is clearly not rational, clearly not logical, clearly not sensible, clearly very silly. So I've seen the light Let's chuck it out. And of course, one of the most famous proponents of this idea was the Bishop of Durham. He was a fellow that was around in, in, my, in my time when I was a bit younger. He was David Jenkins. And uh, 
He said, well, he caused controversy because he said the virgin birth was impossible. And uh, not only did he believe that the, Christian, the, the Christmas narrative was not true, he, he didn't even believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, dare I mention her name in these parts of Yorkshire, but uh, Margaret Thatcher called him a cuckoo in the establishment's nest, meaning that he was an imposter stealing Bible truths. Now, before we, we go on to um, be too hard on Bishop David Jenkins, um, let me mention about a, 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 a survey conducted in the Daily Telegraph in 2002 amongst five ang 500 Anglican clergy, and it discovered that 27% of them didn't believe in the virgin birth. Deary me. And before we get too hard on these unbelieving vicars, let's ask ourselves, do we believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe, wherever you're watching this broadcast, do you believe in the virgin birth? Well, I believe in science. And science tells me that it can't be true. Well, the, the mantra, I believe in science, I'm following the scientific data, um, we have to be led by science, is, is very common at the moment. And one of the things that I've noticed in this pandemic with us supposedly being led by the science is that the science is changing every five minutes. <laughs> science is only as good as our understanding and our understanding is limited. And once we get a bit more understanding, well then our science changes. So scientists used to think that the sun was made from coal. Scientists used to think that if you had a fever or a disease, the way to to cure yourself was to what they call bloodlet. They used to slash people's uh, veins and, and draw blood from them. And they said that was the way that was gonna heal them. And uh, you can read any scientific book more than 10 years old and you'll find that it's different from today's science. The Hubble telescope, for example, when that was launched and we got the first pictures back from that, changed scientific understanding. It changed the idea about our, uh, our understanding of the, the universe. And no doubt, in the future, when our understanding gets a bit better and another telescope is launched and people discover more, then the science about the beginnings of the universe will change again. So the point I'm making here is that you can't base your life on so-called science. Really, it comes down to whether you believe whether God is the God of the impossible. And I get it that these people who, who are, <laughs> this, this is in the news at the minute, apparently that there's some uh, divergence of uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the skies at the moment. And if you go outside, uh, they're very close together and they have the uh, illusion of, 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 of a bright star in the sky. And apparently this is the first time that this has happened in 800 years and it's not going to happen for, for yonks uh, to come, many years to come. And uh, a lot of people say, well, this proves it, that this could well have been the star that the wise men saw when they went to visit the baby Jesus. But hear me right. My belief in the star the wise men followed is not whether science can prove whether two planets were converging at that particular time and it looked like a bright star. It's based upon the word of God. The impossible is possible, not because science says it could have happened, but because God is God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So there is an application for us today, this morning, whatever time you're watching this broadcast. Do we believe God is God or not? Do we believe what he says in his word or not? Or are we basing our lives upon science that is forever shifting or on our experience which is inadequate? I hope you're believing in God, basing your life upon God, who is the same yesterday, today and forever, whose promises never fail, who is consistent, who is faithful. Hallelujah. So, I like the words of Mary next. Uh, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you have said. 
I am the Lord's servant. She was making herself available to um, be and do whatever God wanted to do through her for his glory. And I was thinking about what Mary could have said, because when you think about it, it was a big ask, wasn't it? Uh, she could have said, well, God, <laughs> or, or, or Gabriel, can you send a message back to God for me? Um, do you think we could wait until after the wedding? Um, what about Joseph? Uh, what is he going to say? How, how am I going to explain this to mum and dad? What about the deposit that we've put down on the reception? <laughs> We haven't got anywhere to live. I'm going to have to take my dress back. Joseph and I were thinking that we might settle down for a couple of years and uh, make a, a little home for ourselves before we have any more children. I don't have any money. What is everybody else going to think? I want you to notice here that she was willing to surrender everything to do what God had asked her to do. I wonder whether we are so eager. She was willing to be misunderstood. Mum and dad, this is the conversation she's having with mum and dad. Mum and dad, the, the, the wedding's off. I'm pregnant and Joseph isn't the father. I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And the, and the parents would want to well, disown her or hire her away or or, or, you know, be so ashamed that they dare not show their faces in the street ever again. She risked losing Joseph. After all, they didn't have DNA tests in those days, did they? She couldn't say, well, Joseph, um, I'm pregnant, but it's by God. Um, and I can prove it. I can prove that it's not the, the chap across the road who's made me pregnant because we can have a DNA test when the child is born. She couldn't do that. She risked losing Joseph. It would bring humiliation to her and her whole family. She had to put her plans on hold, put her dreams on hold. She was willing to be stoned. What do you mean willing to be stoned? Well, the penalty for adultery, the penalty for having a child out of wedlock was stoning. It was a big risk that she was putting herself into. Now, here's the question, what would you have done? But here's a more important question. What will you do when God asks you to be part of his divine assignment? Are you gonna say, what will my spouse think? What will my family think? What will my friends think? What will the street think? How will this affect my plans? How does this affect my agenda for 2021? Because I had it all planned out in my diary. Or are you going to say, I am the Lord's servant? We only have to look at King Herod um, to see that he had an attitude quite the contrary that contrasts with that of Mary. When he found out that the wise men had come to worship the newborn king on his patch, he was troubled and he ordered the murder of every child under the age of two to be murdered. Good gracious me, what an insecure person Herod was. But it also tells me something else, that he didn't want anybody else to sit on the throne of his life. He wanted to be king. He wanted to be his own boss. He was threatened by the king of kings. Herod wanted himself to be on the throne and not be told by anybody else what to do. Quite the opposite of Mary's attitude. And do you know what? You and I were created to live under the guidance and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because God has the best things for us. And when we put ourselves on our own throne and when we do things our own way, we are destined to ruin, not blessing. And because God has, um, has always got our best interests in heart. Listen to what Luke 1 48 says. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. He has been mindful. He cares. He takes notice. And here's another word for some of you that may be watching here on this live broadcast. You may think that, that God 
hasn't noticed you, doesn't care. I want to encourage you uh, of Mary's words, to remember Mary's words. He has been mindful of me and he is mindful of you. He is not aloof. He's not disinterested. He is interested in every part of your life and he wants to bless you. He's interested in your life because he wants to do you good. He's interested in your, your life because you were designed to be led and guided by him. Herod did not want to be told what to do by anyone else. He wanted to do what he thought he knew what was best. And so often that can be true of us. We don't want to know Jesus. We want to eliminate God from our lives because we want to live the way, uh, we want to live our lives the way that we please. It was, I am the Lord's servant. He is my Lord. He is my king, said Mary. So just as an aside, um, I want you to notice on Mary's part, this was total submission, not partial submission. And uh, over the last couple of uh, weeks, you may have heard illustrations from this by uh, preachers, but uh, I found this quite amusing when I, when I heard it, and I'll, I'll share it with you today. So often we, we approach God as if he is the Burger King. What do you mean by that, Ian? Well, when you go into Burger King, you can say, well, leave off the onions, leave off the gherkins, leave off the mayo, I'll have extra tomato sauce. You pick and choose the bits that you like according to your taste, and you, leave off the, you ask to leave off the bits that you don't like according to your personal preferences. So often people can approach God as their Burger King. They just pick the bits that they like and reject the bits that they don't like. But Jesus does not want to be your Burger King. He wants to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He just doesn't want you picking and choosing according to your taste, but he wants you to be completely obedient to his divine assignment for you because he has got good things in store for you. For Mary, God was absolute King. It's not about me, but it's about you. Now, I've got a confession to make. I've got so far in preparing this message on Monday without looking at the good old King James Version. And I discovered there was one word that is omitted six times from the NIV and most other translations from Luke chapter one. And do you know what that word is that's omitted? Yes, you've guessed it, the word Behold, <laughs> behold, because Luke 1 38 says, should read, and Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. So again, what she's saying to Gabriel is behold, I want you to take note that when I'm saying that I am your servant, I'm God's servant, when I'm saying that I am willing to be obedient, I mean it with my whole heart. I mean it most assuredly. I want you to take note and prick your ears up because what I'm about to say is not empty words. It's not half-hearted. Behold, I am the Lord's maidservant. Be it unto me according to your word. I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you've said. Nothing is impossible with God. Behold, let it be to me as you have said, let it be to me according to your word. How is it that Mary could say to Gabriel, let it be unto me according to your word with such confidence? How is it that she took God's word to her with full-hearted faith. And I believe it was because she was already steeped in the word of God. She had seen his promises fulfilled over the generations. Look at part of the song that I'm going to read to you that Mary sang in front of Elizabeth. Well, we, we call it the Magnificat, the song that Mary sang, but here are the words uh, from verse 50 
It says, His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. You know, she knew the word of God. There are umpteen verses, umpteen references to the Old Testament here. She knew the word of God. She knew the Old Testament stories. She knew the Old Testament action and the narrative. She knew where God had moved in power. And she knew how God had been faithful from one generation to the next generation. And when God turns up on her doorstep and asks her to do something, she has no hesitancy in believing what he is saying. Let it be to me according to your word, the word of God. And what was true for Mary is true for us. Because if we want to have full confidence in the word of God, we need to steep our lives in the word of God. If you're struggling be with, with believing the word of God, read it and allow the Holy Spirit to bring it alive to inspire your faith. Because as uh, the scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hallelujah. So let's wrap up now, shall we? Nothing is impossible with God. Don't base uh, of what can and can't happen upon science. Don't base what can and can't happen upon your experience. God is God. That is why he is called God. What he says is true. God is reliable. His words do not fail. His promises to you do not fail. His promises to forgive you do not fail. His promise, promises to make you whole, body, mind and spirit do not fail. We were created to be led and guided by God and for him to be the king of kings in our lives. It's the only way that I, it's the only way that you can know blessing, abundant blessing in your lives. The only way that we can know a blessing in our lives is if we take the, ourselves off the throne and put him on the throne. We don't make him the burger king, we make him the king of kings. 100% king. We need to say, let your word reign supreme in my life and may it accomplish what it was spoken forth to do to the glory of his name. Hallelujah. Amen. May you be encouraged by his word today. And maybe as you listen to this, as you watch this, wherever you are, whatever time frame you're watching this in, you say to yourself, well, I need to give my life to Jesus. Well, what a better time to give your life to Jesus than Christmas time. You say to Jesus, I have gone my own way. I've done my own thing. I've messed up. <laughs> but now I want to turn to you. I want to allow you to be king of my life. Come into my life and change my life today to the glory of your name. Lord, change me from the inside out and make me the person that you want me to be to the glory of your name. Make me the person that you created me to be so that I no longer live in fear and dissatisfaction, but I know the joy of knowing you. Hallelujah. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. The silent stars go by 
Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the Praises sing to God the King and peace to all on earth. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born to us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. And yes, Lord, that is our prayer, that you will dwell in our hearts forever and indeed cast out all the sin in our lives. Amen. Um, just before we conclude this broadcast today, I want to pray for you. This year has been a remarkable year. 2020 will go down in history books. We'll be telling our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren about it. Do you remember 2020 when we couldn't even meet together for Christmas? It's been a year of many disappointments. And I know many of you are disappointed today that you can't meet with family, that you've had to cancel plans with celebrations over the coming weekend, and your hearts are down. Well, let me remind you that God is not the God of disappointment. He never lets you down. And whatever has happened in the past lives, in the, in the past year, in your lives. And I know that for some, it's not only been the pandemic, it's been serious illness. For some of you, it's been the loss of dear loved ones. Can I remind you that whatever has happened in this past year, that God is still God. Hallelujah. He is still Lord. He hasn't changed. And he is utterly reliable. And he, at this Christmas time, is the one who never disappoints you. He is the one who can give you peace. He is the one who can reassure you with his loving arms. You know, so often in this past year, I've just wanted to give people a big hug because of the circumstances that they were going through. You know, words couldn't express what I wanted to say, so a hug was going to do it for me. But I haven't been able to do that. But this morning, today, will you know the hug of the Lord around you? Will you know that he loves you? Will, he know that, will you know that he cares for you? Will, he know, will you know that you are secure in his arms? And whatever the past has been, Father, I thank you that you're ahead of us in 2021 and you will lead us and guide us. Lord, oh Jesus. Father, 
2020, for many of us, is a year that we want to forget. It's been a year of heartache for many, a year of distress, a year of fear. But Father, I pray that, Lord, as we remember Christmas and your graciousness towards us, Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, God with us, Father, may we know your presence powerfully today, your comfort, your joy, your peace, your love, your security. And Father, as we step into 2021, may we know your blessing upon blessing, fruitfulness in our lives as we trust in your word. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. C.S. Lewis wrote a book, Surprised by Joy. He was surprised at what joy really meant when he discovered who Jesus is. <laughs> Let's finish our service today with this rendition of Joy to the World.
Hallelujah. All that remains for me to say right now then is God bless you. Have a happy Christmas and a peaceful and prosperous new year trusting in Jesus. And we look forward to meeting again very soon. Our Sunday uh, broadcast will be available on YouTube, seven o'clock UK time. And so until we see you again, don't forget that we love you. God loves you and that God is on your side. Amen.